PowerPoint presentation is Unit 5, the introductory awareness of equality and inclusion in health, social care and children and young people's settings. It's part of the Level 1 Certificate in Introduction to Health, Social Care and Children and Young People's Settings and it is run by Plato Training. The aims and objectives of this session are by the end of the session you will understand the importance of equality and inclusion within health, social care and children and young people's settings. You will understand the effects of discriminatory attitudes and behaviours on individuals. You will have an understanding of social and physical barriers that may prevent equality and inclusion. You will have an understanding of ways to overcome barriers that prevent equality and inclusion. And you will have an understanding of the behaviours that may promote equality and inclusion. You will be using your workbook to answer the questions and it's important that you look out for the green box on each of the slides, usually on the right hand side, to show you which question the slide relates to. It's important that you do share your own ideas when you're working through the PowerPoints. You can use the ideas but, but expand, put them in your own words. They're here to guide with pointers but sharing your own ideas it demonstrates a more and stronger understanding of the content and if you do wish to progress to the next level it shows you're able to do wider reading and have an understanding of the a topic that's up for the discussion. So we're going to start the session by looking at equality and inclusion and what those both mean. But before you do, before you move on to the next few slides, I want you just for a few minutes, just think about what you think equality and inclusion means. You know, when somebody asks you, what is equality? What is inclusion? Just, just think about that for a few minutes. So equality, what does that mean? So equality is about treating people fairly. And more often than not, when we talk about equality and we might ask this question, people often feel it's about treating everybody the same. But we're not all the same. You know, we've talked over the last few weeks, we've looked at person centred care and looking at individual needs and treating people, you know, with for their individual needs. And equality is just that it's about as it says there, make reasonable adjustments so they get equal opportunities. So it's about giving everybody the equal opportunity, letting everybody participate, treating everybody fairly, depending on their individual needs. And you'll see at the bottom, it says equality means the state of being equal. So regardless of race, age, gender, disability, sexual orientation, gender reassignment, religion, beliefs, marital status, maternity and pregnancy. It's about making reasonable adjustments so everybody gets an equal opportunity. And you'll also see on this slide, it talks about the Equality Act 2010. So, you know, this would be a good time to go and do some research, look online, look at the Equality Act 2010, have a look at the summary. We'll give you an overview of the Equality Act and what that means and how that supports individuals. So what does inclusion mean? Well, inclusion is a sense of belonging that involves feeling respected and valued for who you are as an individual or a group. So for example, you're planning an activity for a small group of children in a nursery environment and you want a small group of children all to participate and, and all, you know, all to take part and all feel like they're getting involved, that they, they belong, that, they, you know, that they're, they're involved in that activity. So what you might have to do, you might have to adapt that activity to suit the individual needs. You might have to simplify part of the activity for certain individuals. You might have um, a child with additional need. They may need um, more adult intervention you know you may need to support that child or those children a little bit more than other children but you they all need to feel that they're included and that they're valued and that they're all taking part in that activity so that you know that is inclusion it's about making sure that everybody no matter what is included and feels included and feels respected and valued within that environment
So this brings you to question number one, and it's asking you to define the terms equality and inclusion. Now, we've looked at equality and we've looked at inclusion, but what you need to do, you need to define them, but you need to, you can read the definitions and the meanings of the words and rewrite them in your own words. So, you know, use, use the slides, but put them in your own words. You've, I already talked about you looking at the Equality Act, so you may find something on there that you can use also. But again, you know, wherever you find your information, make sure um, you put in the brackets. So here you've got an example. So you may have found some um, a definition on the Scope website. So put the Scope website there in the brackets. If you do look at the Equality Act and you're taking it from there, put the Equality Act in the brackets. So, but it's really important wherever you get the information from that you do put it into your own words. We're now going to look at slides relating to question number two. And in equality and inclusion, um, and we're looking at principles and values. So we've already looked at principles and values in week two. So we're going to look a little bit more. And principles and values in health, social care, adults, children and young people settings, they're based on equality and inclusion. And these include rights, choices, wishes, needs, likes and dislikes, respect for difference, and valuing difference. So we're going to look over the next few slides at these in more detail. So the next two slides, they look at, at look at rights with regards to equality and inclusion. So everybody has the right to tell training providers about their disabilities or learning difficulties to help the tutor to understand that we may need, for example, larger fonts. And I talked about that a little bit before when we talked about inclusion you know it's about having the rights to be involved and adapting things to help people be involved everyone has a right to learn in a classroom with people with different genders the right to learn in a classroom regardless of whether we're married or not we have a right to learn in a classroom regardless of our race or cultural backgrounds and we have a right to learn in a classroom regardless of our sexual orientation so you'll see that slide there you know we everybody has a right to be involved no matter what so some more examples of rights on this slide so the right to tell hospitals care agencies or nurseries about how we cope with a disability or health condition and what works for us so that the um, workplace can be adapted with reasonable adjustments to help and support us to work there the right to work in a hospital or nursery regardless of our gender now you looked um over um at the safeguarding and um, sometimes, especially with, with regards to working in a nursery, you know, nursery is often seen as um, a female job role and, and it really isn't only a female job role and men are, um, you know, do work in nurseries. But sometimes you may hear people like I'm saying, use the example of safeguarding because people, you know, when we talk about abuse, they may think, um, well, I don't want um, a man changing my child's nappy, but as many women can abuse children as many men so you know this is it you will have a right no matter whether you're male or female to work into in a nursery and the same as a hospital you know gender sometimes when we think sometimes of nurses um not so much now but you know in the past it's a well you know we, we think of women but actually male men can be nurses as well so you know men and women have rights to work in hospital or nursery regardless of, uh, of that the right to work in a nursery hospital or school regardless whether we are married or not the right to work in a nursery hospital or school regardless of our race cultural backgrounds and the right to work in a nursery hospital or school regardless of our sexual orientation so you know again we have rights um, and that's really important for us to understand and those rights that we've talked about and the rights that we have, they stem from the Equality Act 2010. And hopefully you've had a look at the Equality Act 2010, like we talked about in the first, um, which was related to question one. So, you you know, you'll have some more understanding about the rights and, and how they, um, they relate to the Equality Act. And as we've said, I said before, everyone has the right to equal opportunities, regardless of the differences that they have. 
And again, just to reiterate, they could have a different gender, different age, different disabilities or no disability, different sexual orientations, different races, cultures, religions, beliefs. But, you know, that doesn't matter. Everybody has a right um, because, um, you know, set and settings must respect the rights. We're now going to look at um, choices. So by asking what people would like to wear to eat their routine, we need to give choices. Everybody has rights to choices. You know, what would we like to wear? We talked a little bit last week, well, a lot actually about dementia. And, you know, when we're working with um, people suffering from dementia, um, it's still important that we give them choices. They might not be able to tell you you know, um, verbally what they want to wear or what they want to eat. But it's important that you give them the choices in a way that they understand. Dignity. So by um, giving the choice of what we like and dislike, you know, that promotes our dignity. Some people in care, nurseries, childcare settings, like I said before, will not be able to voice the choices but can communicate in different ways. So that could be eye contact. You might, um, you know, if it's something uh, they the, the want to wear, you might, you know, you might go in the wardrobe and choose a couple of their outfits and give them the choices that way. Take them to the wardrobe. Let them show you what they want to wear. Like we said at the beginning, you know, we, we can't treat everybody the same. If we're treating everybody the same, this is not equality and it's called institutional abuse because we're treating everybody with the same when when we are different. Everybody deserves the same opportunity and to make choices and have their individual voice. And, um, you know, this this is important. It's inclusive and gives um, people equal, equality. We're now going to look at wishes, needs, likes and dislikes. And again, it's it's important that we find out this information. Again, we've looked at this a little bit by looking at personal care, um, but by um, you know asking that person, that child, that young person, or somebody who knows them what they like, what they don't like, um, what they need, and what they wish for. That all comes under equality and inclusion, and you know giving everybody that equal opportunity that you know, being fair and, and finding out what, what they want. To provide care and support, respect the individual wishes, the needs, the preferences. So you'll need to find out what you can about them. Taking time to find out about their personal history by talking with them or reading any information you have, care plans, um, you know, that will give you a deeper insight into their likes and dislikes. You know, it, you might you might be working with somebody for the very first time. So it is important that you find out everything as or as much as you can about that individual so that you can, you know, you can manage all of their care as well as their wishes, needs, likes and dislikes. Um, it's important to find out information on the person so that you can respect the needs and beliefs. Um, it may be that their religion does not allow them to eat certain foods. So you need to know this because you're not going, you know, you, you, you don't want to give them that food if, if they don't if they don't eat it um, and obviously you know the care plan like I talked about before needs to be put together with that person involved and again it just it talks about institutional abuse and you know by treating everybody the same this is not equality and everybody ha um, deserves the same opportunity to make choices and have a voice and the final slide relating to question number two, it talks about respecting and valuing differences. So when you're working in health and social care, childcare, young people settings, you will have to undertake mandatory training inequality and diversity every year. And mandatory training means you have to do it. You have to keep yourself up to date with all training, but you know, it's really important. It's mandatory equality and diversity every year because it's important that, that, that the managers know their staff know how to treat people as individuals and follow the Equality Act. And it teaches staff about the differences between um, the you know, people who they're caring for and for the people who are receiving the care. 
and the training is based on the Equality Act 2010, which I'm hoping by now you will have had a look at and I'll have a more understanding of what it actually is and what it means. So this brings you to question number two and it's asking you to outline how equality and inclusion form the basis for the principles and values of health, social care and children and young people settings. To outline you need to write in sentences and create a short paragraph for each example and you know there's a tip there and um, this is taken from your book as well so think back to what equality and inclusion means from the last question then show how equality and inclusion relate to each of the principles and values. We're now going to look at discriminatory attitudes and behaviours. And to start off, we're going to look at discrimination. So, you know, you need to understand what discrimination means um, before we look any further. So discrimination means treating a person unfairly because of who they are or because of, of because they have certain characteristics. And like we've talked about before, about equality, about inclusion, about treating people fairly, making sure everybody's included no matter what. And if we're not treating people unfairly, we're being discriminatory against them. And this slide talks about discriminatory attitudes, and that is, um, is the poor attitude and behavior that people show towards others. And attitudes and behaviours, discriminatory attitudes and behaviours, is when someone judges another person or group of people because of the way they look, how they speak, the music they listen to, or the clothes they like to wear. So we need to be aware um, when we're working in health and social care and generally in life that we know we mustn't be discriminatory against anybody. You know, we have to treat everybody as fair as we possibly can. We need to treat people like we want to be treated. You know, we want to be treated fairly. So we must treat others with respect and have an understanding of their individual needs and not judge them for, for their, their individual needs. Okay, this slide relates to question number three, and I want you to have a look at the different discriminatory attitudes that staff may have, and I want you to think how this might make a service user feel. So somebody that you're working with, service user, how might it make them feel? So assuming that a service user cannot do something because they've got a disability and you do it for them. Not respecting service users not allowing service users to have their rights. So, you know, we talked about confidentiality in the past, haven't we? So, you know, by actually not keeping their confidentiality, so how might that make them feel? Not allowing a service user to have a voice in their care, so their needs and their wishes, you know, if you're not letting them speak, how might that make them feel? Not allowing a service user to complain about the service they receive. So if they're not happy with the service they receive, you know, how will they feel if you don't let them complain? Not allowing service users time to complete tasks. So, for example, if they have a visual impairment, they may take longer to find their outfit of choice. But if you're not giving them the time, you know, how might that make them feel? So have a few minutes to think about those um, situations there and then we'll move to the next slide and we can see some of the um, some of the uh, ideas. So the first one, so assuming that a service user cannot do something because of the disability and doing it for them. So they may feel like they have no purpose. You know, we have talked in the past about independence. We have to try and support people to be as independent for as long as they possibly can. So, you know, if, if they've got a disability and you just think it's quicker to do it for them, you know, they're not going to feel like they've got any purpose not respecting them. So if you don't respect a service user, they'll, they, they may feel low in confidence because you're not respecting them for who they are. Not allowing them to have their rights, such as confidentiality. So they may, they may feel frustrated. They're not going to trust you if you're not, you know, if you're breaching their confidentiality for one, you know, you shouldn't be doing it because it's not, you know, the procedures are in place. And for two, they're not going to trust you not allowing service users to have a voice in the care so they you know they'll feel disempowered they just they just won't feel worthy if you're speaking for them and not letting them speak for themselves not allowing service users to complain 
um, they may feel disempowered also, uh, not allowing service users time to complete tasks like we spoke about before, if they've got a visual impairment, you know, it might take them longer and they'll feel frustrated and feel they may feel angry, you know, because you're not giving them the time to choose that outfit or you're not giving them the time to complete um, tasks. So this um, is question number three, and it's asking you to identify at least four discriminatory attitudes that staff working in health and social care sector could have. Now, you'll see there, I've taken um, it from the book. So um, for each attitude, you need to give the examples of how discriminatory attitude can affect the person or the child receiving care. So in the left hand side of the box, you need to use the discriminatory attitude. And then on the right side, you need to write a sentence of how this attitude could affect the person or the child receiving the care. Think about the examples on the last slide, but also think about some of your own examples and also, you know, making sure you do put um, it into a sentence. So you'll see on this slide, in, highlighted in yellow, um, so the service user, if we're ignoring a service user, they may feel depressed. If we prepare activities that some service users cannot take part in, they may feel withdrawn from the setting if, in, and feel like that they don't fit in. You know, if we're providing activities, everybody needs to take part because, you know, it's just not fair. Not allowing some service users to participate. Again, they may feel upset. They may feel depressed. They're not getting involved. Keeping some service users separated from others in different areas, so they may feel low confidence, they may feel scared, unable to communicate how they're feeling. Using offensive language can make somebody feel angry, it can cause aggression and it can cause people to be frustrated. Using inappropriate language like jargon um, and you know aiming it at the wrong age group, it's not age appropriate language. It may may feel they may feel unable to communicate with the staff, as they, you know they can't comprehend what what they mean. They're not understanding what you're saying to them because it's not um, it's either jargon or it's not age appropriate for them to understand. By not addressing somebody by their chosen name, um, may make them feel frustrated. So you now need to answer question four and identify at least four discriminatory behaviours that staff could have. Uh, for each behaviour, you need to give examples of how the discriminatory behaviours can affect the person or the child receiving the care. The discriminatory behaviour is on the left hand side and the behaviour, how it could affect the person is on the right hand side. And you need to write um, a sentence um, you know, to um, explain that. So the next few slides relate to question number five, number six and number seven. And we're looking at social barriers. So I want you to think, first of all, for a few minutes, what are social barriers that may prevent equality and inclusion? We're now going to look at um, slide that relates to question five, question six and question seven and we're going to look at social barriers. Now this slide looks at some social barriers and then the next slide is we're going to look at how we can overcome the social barriers. So we're first going to look at the barriers. So you know there's some examples of social barriers here. So a service user not being able to communicate with staff. So that is a barrier. Negative attitudes of staff not seeing people before their disability or their other differences. Criticising service users for not being able to do things. Not being able to financially afford to get equipment to make their lives easier. So, for example, you know, an assistive iPad that has been changed so they can control it differently. Cultural issues, so not being able to join in some activities because of physical contact, like dancing. So, you know, thinking about social care there, you know, if you're, if you're working in a, in, a, in a care home, for example, um, there may be um, dancing activities, but um, if, if, if some people might not be able to join in because of their, their culture. 
So you will see on this slide which still relates to question five, question six and question seven. Um, so how can we overcome some of the social barriers that we talked about on the last slide? So a service user not being able to communicate with staff. So use appropriate and the service user's choice of preferred language to communicate with them. And staff may need, ed need educating in this to, to, um, to be able to communicate. It could be like we've talked about uh, British Sign Language, you talked about Makaton, so it might be that you need to um, go on, on a training course to be able to communicate. Negative attitudes of staff not seeing people before the disability or their other differences. Staff may need to undergo equality and diversity training, go on a refresher course, um, you know, because a negative attitude of staff not seeing people before their disability or of the differences shouldn't be happening in, in any um, working environment. Criticising service users for not being able to do things. So consultations with the manager, family, the service user to ensure that individual needs are being met and independence is being promoted. Not being able to financially afford to get equipment to make lives easier. So helping them to access financial support from charities relevant to the disability. So, for example, Mencap, which is a charity there that actually, um, you know, may provide um, funding or uh, equipment to support somebody to, to, to make their lives easier. Um, the cultural issues, so we talked about not being able to join into uh, physical uh, activities because of physical contact like dancing. So, you know, how can we overcome that barrier? And staff would need to be aware of differences. They may need a, re you know, a, a refresher of the equality and diversity training so that they're aware of the things that they can plan to support um, every, uh, to ensure that everybody's involved. So question five, question six and question seven, all three are the same question. And with each one, you need to identify a social barrier that may prevent equality and inclusion and then outline how the barrier to equality and inclusion may be overcome. So think of some of the examples we've talked about, but also think of some of your own. And you need to, you know, there's, there's three social barriers in total. So one for five, one for six and one for question seven. OK, so we're now going to look at slides relating to question eight, nine, 10 and 11. And we're going to look what are physical barriers that may prevent equality and inclusion. So for a few minutes, just have a think about that. You know, we've talked about social barriers before. So what are physical barriers that may prevent equality and inclusion? OK, so we're going to look at the slide now with some physical barriers on and then I want you just to have to have a think about each one and, you know, how might we overcome these physical barriers and think about that before you move over to the next slide where um, there are some ideas of how you can overcome them. So inappropriate transport. So, for example, not being able to get in and out of a car. No ramps. So there's no ramps to the building. So you're not able to use the stairs. Restrict, restricted access for wheelchairs, so no suitable entrances, so somebody's in a wheelchair, it's a physical barrier. No facilities for Braille, so some blind people can only read with Braille. No facilities for induction loops, some people with lack of hearing use these to help their hearing aids to hear. And broken lifts, so not being able to access some parts of the building because the lifts are not operating. OK, so this slide gives some examples of how the barriers, some of the barriers um, can be overcome. So inappropriate transport, so not being able to get in and out of a car. So risk assessments need to be done. A risk assessment of the transport would need to be completed and adapted um, and adapt the transport to suit the individual needs um, for that for that trip or, you know, that, that appointment of, of where that person needs to go. No ramps, not able to use the stairs, so you need to adapt the physical environment. You can use portable ramps. Staff need to be um, trained with, to use the ramps and also within manual handling because you may be having to lift people onto the ramps. 
restricted access for wheelchairs, so having no suitable entrances, so making the physical adaptions to the building if appropriate. Some buildings are listed buildings, so it can be quite difficult, or use alternative premises to be able to meet the needs of the individual. No facilities for Braille. So find out if people need Braille first of all, consult with the families or the individual and get support from charities for the blind with translation and documentation. Printing will need someone, um, you know, someone will need to be able to support them to read it as well. No facilities for induction loops. So some people with lack of hearing they use these to help them to hear. So find out if people do need a hearing loop. So again, you know, it's not just to presume that people need these facilities or these things. You need to ask the person or the families and then, you know, you need to get installation of a hearing loop and staff needs to be trained in how to use it if you are going to have one. Broken lifts and not being able to access some parts of the building. Again, physical adaptions. So, you know, change rooms, change the venue and call the engineer to fix the lift um, if you're able to. So this brings you to question number eight, number nine, number 10 and number 11. And all four questions are the same. And for each one, you need to identify a physical barrier that may prevent equality and inclusion and then outline how the barrier to equality and inclusion may be overcome. So you need to think of four different physical barriers. Use the slides to help you and also do some further research to help you some more to give maybe some of your own um, physical barriers that you that you find. So this slide relates to question number 12, which is the last question of the um, of the session. And we're going to look at behaviours to promote equality and inclusion. So we're going to look, how can we do this? How can we promote this to make people feel included and feel worthy and feel feel valued? So it's important to recognise a person as an individual to meet their needs. Ensure you seek approval before taking any actions concerning an individual. So like we've said, you know, consult with the family, consult with the individual, you know, get permission, approval before you do anything regarding their care. Ensure you use inclusive language. So find out their preferred choice of communication. Assessment of the environment to ensure access. Can it be changed? Is it suitable for all? We've just looked at some of the barriers and, you know, we do need to make sure it's accessible. We do need to make sure that it's suitable for everybody. You know, access is really important. If you're in, everybody needs to be able to get into the environment. Making eye contact with all members of the group. Don't miss anyone out. You know, if you're talking to a group of people, make sure you give eye contact to them all so that you, they know that you're talking to them. Offer choices, promote independence. We, you know, we've talked a little bit about that already. Giving choices and, and that then promotes their independence. If you're giving people choices, they're making decisions for themselves and they're being independent. Including individuals in all activities. So making sure they're suitable for everyone. Like we said at the beginning, you know, if you're planning activities, you may need to adapt to suit um, individual needs, but then it's suitable for everyone to take part. And this brings you to question number 12. You need to outline at least four behaviours that may promote equality and inclusion. So at least four, no less than four. You can do more, but you know, at least four. So the behaviour to promote equality and inclusion in the left hand box, and then you're going to um, outline how this behaviour can promote equality and inclusion on the right hand side, making sure you write in sentences when you're um, giving your answer. So now you've come to the end of the session. And from the session, you will now know the importance of equality and inclusion within health, social care and children and young people's settings. You will know the effects of discriminatory attitudes and behaviours on individuals. You will know social and physical barriers that may prevent equality and inclusion. You will know ways to overcome barriers that prevent equality and inclusion. And you will know the behaviours that may promote equality and inclusion.